Good morning. Good morning. How are you? Good. Hello. Okay. Everybody can see that okay? Yep. Okay. Hi, Evelyn. Let's see who else is here. Mitzi's here. One, two. I think everybody will be here and if they're not then they can pop in in a little bit. All right. Hello everyone. My name is Caitlin Costello and I am the grant coordinator for Genesee Valley Council on the Arts and I want to thank you for coming to our seminar today. I'm going to be discussing our decentralization grant today and some of the tips and tricks as well as the application process uh, in my portion of the seminar and then I'm going to pass it over to Evelyn D'Agostino, I'm not sure how I pronounce your last name, and Missy Feifel, and we're going to go through some stuff with them. They're going to explain what their process has been like in the past as a applicant who has received the grant, and any tips and tricks that they have come up with, any sticky points that they have had while applying for grants in the past, and then we'll open it up to a Q&A at the end. So if at any point during this conversation you have any questions that come up, you can drop them right in the chat box on the side. And then when we are finished, we can use that as a reference point to go through. If you have any little, little friends, be them furry or human, if they stop by or make any noise, that's totally fine. As I said, I'm in a different setting today and I have two dogs that are here that want to say hi to me that are behind a gate. So if you hear whining or crying from them, that's probably, they want to come say hi. So if you have someone that wants to do the same, that's totally fine. So we're going to get into the types of grants. There are two main types of grants. They're monetary and non-monetary. The grants that we offer are monetary as you receive a stipend to create a program. They're within the monetary grants, there is restricted and unrestricted grants. Restricted means that it has to be related to the project or application that you are trying to put forward. Unrestricted means that you can use the funds for anything. And emergency funds are what we're seeing a lot of right now around COVID-19 where uh, agencies like New York State Council on the Arts are giving out more grants for emergency funding for individuals and companies. Non-monetary grants would include residency programs, access to studios, equipment, training, apprenticeships, working with individuals to train, things like that. When applying for a grant, there's some points that you want to consider. Uh, you want to take a look at your current art practice and see where you are in your process and if moving forward with a grant is something that would be beneficial to you based on where you are and if it will help to elevate what you are creating. You want to look at what exactly do you want to do and make a concrete plan because it's really hard to do the narrative portions of most grants if you're not exactly sure what you want to do or where you want to go. And in that will help you to figure out what exactly are your needs and what do you need to reach that goal that you want to do to further your artistic practice. So there are many resources outside of our grant with GBCA. Some of them uh, has high reaching from the federal government are from the National Endowment on the Arts or the NEA, the National Endowment for the Humanities or the NEH, New York State Council on the Arts, as I said before, or NISCA, the Foundation Center, and the New York Foundation on the Arts or NIFA. So we're going to go through and break down a bunch of different points within types of grants. So you want to look into what is the type of award going back to that uh, monetary or non-monetary is it going to help you in what way what is your eligibility looking over the guidelines and making sure that you do fit the criteria for example and we'll get to later for our grants if you're a student you're not eligible so that would be something that would immediately knock you out of the running and something that you need to consider you want to look at the size of the grant and how much does the average recipient receive and does that line up with what you are looking for and how many people normally 
receive the grant that they are applying for. For example, for Monroe County, usually about 62% of our applicants receive funding and the average amount that they will receive is about 2,700. For Livingston County, about 57% of people receive funding and that averages out to around $1,800. And that is across all of our grant types. Um, and then we have three grants that we will get into later. You wanna look into the frequency and how often does the program run? Do they offer grants more than once a year, every couple of years, every, is there only certain times of year that you can qualify for the grant? Uh, you wanna look at the deadlines and see if the deadlines for the grant make sense for the project you're trying to put on. If you need funding for a project that you hope to happen in January, but you see that we're not going to be funding or passing out checks until February, is that going to work? Can you do that carryover in between, things like that? And within that timeline, how does the distribution work? Do you get it all at one time? Do you get it over a series of time? Do you get it in one lump sum check? And can you, in that time, make it from when you discover the grant to when the application is, create a well-rounded application within that timetable? Another thing you want to look into is who your funder is. Uh, there's a lot of cases where artists will see, oh, there's this grant that's giving out X amount of money, and they apply and something happens and then they don't get that money and the program falls through because the source that they're looking for isn't a reputable source. So I'd always encourage you to do research into the organization that you were applying for. And lastly, you'd wanna look at the past recipients. Are the people that have been funded in the past, people that align with your vision and what you want to create? Are they re receiving money for projects that are in a similar vein to you or have parallels that you can use to compare the two grants to try to develop yours. Things around that. If it's something where your project is so completely different, that could be beneficial. It could make you stand out in a good way, but it could also be not great because you're not near what is normally produced, if that makes sense. So with the application, as I said before, read all of the guidelines and all of the instructions. You'd be really, really surprised how many people get negated for little things that could easily be avoided, be it around the budget or uh, certain materials that need to be submitted. Oh, got a couple more sheets here. Sorry about that. Um, so really make sure that you look over all of the guidelines and every little thing. When I get the guidelines and I'm working through them, I go through and I highlight all of the little bits that I think could be sticky for people to make sure that everyone is hitting those points when I go through later and I'm reviewing the application. And if you aren't sure on something, I highly, highly encourage you to reach out to me or one of the other uh, staff at GVCA or for any grant you're applying for. If you have a question on something that you can't find the answer for right away in the guidelines or in other source material, it is probably something that someone else has a question about and can help us to make sure that the process is streamlined and better for the future. And I can definitely easily explain most things within a reasonable amount of time. So within most grant applications, there are three components. There's the project narrative, the project budget, and any supporting or supplemental materials. Okay. So we're gonna go into those three categories now. Maybe my computer will fix. There we go. So the project narrative, oh, now we're just going all sorts of places. I'm not sure who else has audio on, but I'm just gonna go through and make sure everybody is muted. Um, so the project narrative is a written diagram, itinerary, whatever you want to call it, of what your proposed project is. And there will be some guided questions on how to fill this out as you go through our application, which I will show you in a little bit.
but this is really the chance for you to describe your project and really go into detail into what you want to do. And some of the things that you really want to hit on are what are your qualifications? Why should myself and our panel choose you to do your project? What makes you stand out amongst the sea of other applicants? What is your project timeline? And really make sure you are detailing that out as to, I'm going to do this at this time and this at this time and produce this here. What is your marketing plan? And how are you going to reach your target audience? And who is your target audience? Are you gonna use social media? Are you use, going to use traditional print media? Are you gonna do email lists? How are you gonna reach your audience? And within your marketing plan, if you do have a social media presence already, we definitely wanna know that and please share links. Tell us how many people are in your audience. Those little things can really build up your presence. You wanna look into also what are your expected outcomes? Is it you want to grow the presence of your company? Is it you want to produce your first solo gallery art show? What is it that you want to develop and how do you want this grant to help promote you in the future. And finally, one other thing that you would want to look into is how are you going to evaluate the success of your program? Is it going to be ticket sales? Is it going to be buzz around town? Is it going to be how the talk back goes after a performance? Is it a survey that will be shared after? Things like that. It's really beneficial to show how you're going to measure if it was a successful program or not. The project budget. This is one section that can be sticky for people. Um, so the budget is a line by line breakdown of how you plan on using the funds if you should receive that funding. And you want to be as detailed as you possibly can. So some of the terms that are used on our budgets are personnel expenses. And this would be anyone that you would hire for the project, be it artists or teachers or assistants, would be person to hanging the lights and a customer, any of the individuals that you would be paying. Non-personnel expenses would be things like travel and space rental and any advertising costs that would fall into your marketing budget. Remaining operating expenses would be supplies and materials, some of the equipment rental, and this would also include PPE. Earned income would be anything that your project directly generates. Be this ticket sales, a fundraiser, if you have merchandise, concessions, um, ads in a program, those would be direct sales from your program. Unearned or contributed income would be money that your project receives, but it doesn't earn on its own. For example, if you reach out to a company and they donate a certain amount of money for your project, that would be unearned or contributed income. In-kind contributions are a little bit different, and that would be considered something that you generally would have to pay for but is being given to you to use. For example, if you are in partnership with a theater and it's generally $300 to rent the theater space for the night, but the theater is giving you that space and you don't need to pay, that would be $300 of in-kind contributions. In-kind contributions will go over later where they don't fall into your project budget, but we still like to see it to know how things are falling out to make sure that all of your bases are being covered. The more detailed you can be with the budget, the better. So supporting and supplemental materials are the last section of the application. And this is anything else that is going to support your project and to give a more rounded feel of what is going on. And this would include resumes and CVs of yourself or any artists that you are hiring artist samples of prior work. Uh, if you are a nonprofit organization or you're working with a nonprofit organization as a fiscal sponsor, you would need to include their nonprofit status. If it's a government organization, this would be like your charter information, things like that. And if you're doing an arts and ed application, this could include your lesson plans and your evaluation. 
So now we're going to get into the specifics of our decentralization program or DEC grant. Some of the things that we're going to be discussing in this today are going to be NISCA, New York State Council on the Arts, and their relation to our decentralization program, the specific eligibility requirements for each of our grants, the different funding categories of our grants, the application process where I will show you our application this year and any changes on it, and the grant review and notification process. So, New York State Council on the Arts is the is our funder for where we get our money. The New York State Council on the Arts' mission is to preserve and expand the rich and diverse cultural resources that are and will be the heritage of all New Yorkers. And NISCA does this through its local arts with a partnership with the decentralization program. Our program is one of many different things that they fund and we're very thankful for that. Um, so if you find that your program is a little bit too big for our grant, NISCA does have the same sort of funding on a larger scale. So if you think that you've outgrown or are too big for a grant, I would highly encourage you to look there. It is a more difficult process though. So the decentralization program was funded in 1977 to help to encourage this state and local partnerships of growing art outside of the main hubs that you see in New York City and other big cities throughout the state. And it's one of the best ways that they have found to curate and produce this art. And as I said before, we are at Genesee Valley Council on the Arts support Livingston and Monroe counties, but there is other partnerships all across the state. So if you are from a different county or you want to work in a different county, you would have to reach out to those separate locations. Most of the rules are the same, but there is some little things that change from here, here and there. So going into the requirements, you must live and or reside in Livingston or, Mor Livingston or Monroe County. Uh, you have to be a nonprofit organization or be a individual artist working in partnership with a fiscal sponsor and or school or a government entity or tribal organization. And as I said, the, the proposed project must take place in the same county as the applicant's address. So if you are from a different county, but you want to work in Monroe or in Livingston, you need to have a partner that resides in the county and they would be the person that would apply for you. If you do, oh, clicking ahead. Uh, if you have applied for NISCA or you work with an organization that has applied for a NISCA grant in the last year, you are not eligible for funding for this grant and you would not be able to act as a fiscal sponsor. And I think the next slide is where we're gonna get into some of the details within that. Uh, if you have applied for NISCA in the past, but not within the last cycle, you would be eligible for this grant. So NISCA, as we get the money from New York State, you can't, it gets, it gets kind of tricky. If I am an applicant and I work with NISCA, I cannot then fund a project for a DEC grant because the money comes from the same pool and then it would be considered double dipping. So there is ways you can work with NISCA applicants, but you have to make sure that the two organizations are very separate and very clear. As such, if I work with a theater that has received New York State Council on the Arts funding, I have to make sure that I, as a DEC grantee, do not have them do anything with the ticket sales. I do not pay them anything for the space rental or anything for marketing so that there isn't that merging of the funds. It, they may give me the space to use as a, a gift for the night as a in-kind contribution, but I cannot pay them. New this year though, you are able to list your project, for example, on a NISCA website or a grantee website saying that they are working with them. But 
you can, if you are, end up thinking that you'll be with an ISCA person, definitely reach out to me and we can work out the details and figure out how that works. It, it gets very complex and I feel like I'm not explaining it great. And I wanna make sure I do it well. <laughs> so the, some of the things that the decentralization can fund are our artist fees. We wanna make sure that artists are being paid for the work that they create. The marketing and publicity costs in this day and age, it's not cheap to get your name out there, and we want to make sure that everybody has a chance to see your art and to know it exists. This would include space and equipment rentals. Sometimes you don't have access to that outside of receiving money from someone. We get that. We want to make sure you get that funding. And any direct administrative costs. This will include in the future going down to equipment and software Zoom and other resources to virtually share your programs. Uh, and we now will be helping to create uh, and the purchase of supplies, but it can't be more than $1,000. So if there is a lighting rig or a camera that I want to get that's $1,000 or less, go for it. That's great. But if it's more than that much, it's gonna, you'll need to find something else. Some things that we will not fund are New York State agencies and departments. Going back to NISCA, it's the same pool of money. Public or private colleges or universities, or public or private schools or parochial schools, this also includes home schools. It has to be a public entity. The startup costs of building a new company or establishing a new organization, um, permanent equipment, more than $1,000, or capital improvements are things that we will not fund. Along with cash prizes, scholarships, or rewards, one-off events such as galas, benefits, fundraisers, uh, things like that, food and student projects. Unfortunately, we do not fund anything coming from a student. You have to already be graduated from the program. So. Okay, so now we're going to get into the individual funding categories that we have for GVCA. So we have three programs, as I said before, we have the community arts grants, the individual artists, and the arts and education. That would be my dog. Um, all three of these are open to a variety of different project types from visual to literary and many different performing types. And the applicants may submit up to three different applications or requests up to an amount of $5,000, whichever comes first. So the community arts grant must provide an open experience for someone in the community. Uh, this would include exhibitions and workshops, performances, festivals, screenings, stage readings, things like that. And the project must be community based. Anybody can walk up and attend your project. And we really, really like to see that it's targeting an underserved population. How is it going to help the community to bring the arts? Is it the only display of public art in the area? Is it bringing up a topic that is very difficult in that area that people need more education on? Is it giving kids a chance to work in the arts in a way that they've never been able to before? And so that goes into what is the community benefit and how is it going to grow and help? There we go. So the maximum funding request for the community arts grant is $5,000. And new this year, we will cover up to 80% of the project's expenses. Within your budget, you have to have shown some sort of income, be it from fundraisers or merchandise, sales like that. There has to be a 20% match. So for example, if your request is up to $1,000, you need to show at least $200 of income from somewhere, and we would be able to fund up to $800 of that. 
And for this, nonprofit organizations, local government entities, and individual artists partnering with, partnering with a fiscal sponsor can apply. What is a fiscal sponsor? A fiscal sponsor is an organization that is going to act as the conduit through which an individual artist who does not have maybe the renown or the business savviness that an organization has. Um, so the fiscal sponsor will act as the conduit to help you with that. This fiscal sponsor has to be a nonprofit organization and they have to be based within Livingston or Monroe County, depending on where you, the artist, reside. The fiscal sponsor will be the applicant on record and they will be the one that is awarded the check. And then they will act as the conduit and distribute the money to the artist as needed. And they will also act as a sort of big brother, big sister to make sure that paperwork is being turned in on time and that publicity is happening and things are happening the way that the applicant, the artist applicant has said that they will produce the program. They sort of act as another in-between person uh, between me and the artist. Our individual artist grants is specifically for those artists that are getting started and want to build up a project in their discipline that they might not be able to do on their own, but might not be big enough for a community arts grant, or they don't want to go into a community arts grant. Similar to a community arts program, there needs to be some sort of exhibition or performance that is open to the public that anybody can attend. And there needs to be some sort of community involvement in the project. New this year, we are expanding the funding amounts from, uh, before it was you could get flat $2,500, now it's expanding out to you can get anywhere from $1,000 to $2,500. This does also mean that we have the opportunity to fund more artists. In the past, we have, per New York State rules, we were only able to fund four. Now, if, for example, everybody applies requesting $1,000, we could fund up to 10 people, which in particular for Monroe County, thinking of last year, is a really, really big deal. We had 11 individual artists apply last year and we could only fund four. So now we will have the opportunity to make more art in the community with this expansion, which is something I'm really excited about. <laughs> so eligibility, the applicant has to be 18 at the time of the application and cannot be enrolled in an education program. So we can't have students from MCC or GCC or anything like that where they're wanting to do this on the side or any other big college. The project, again, must take place in the county of your residence. And we would not fund any programs with no community engagement or if you have received an individual artist grant in the past two cycles. So for example, up to if you received an individual artist grant in 2019, you would have to wait until next year before you could apply for the grant. And the final grant that we have is the arts and education grant. This is a grant where an artist, a teaching artist goes directly into a school or an adult class environment to facilitate the education of some sort of art. We are opening it this year to involve preschool as well, which is really fun. I love working with little kids and I'm really excited to see what is produced from this in the future. And this has to be, again, a community-based learning. So everybody is working together to learn something or produce something. There has to be at least three hands-on learning experiences with the same group of individuals. So whereas the community arts grants and the individual artist was open to the community and anybody could walk up and do it, the arts and education is the same specific set group of individuals every single time. If it is working with a school, there has to be some involvement with some member of the school faculty be it one of the teachers is also helping to teach the classes or something to that regard. It can't just be you want to go in and do this project and there's no involvement from the school. The maximum request for this grant is also $5,000.
And similar to the community arts grants, we will fund up to 80% of the project and the 20% must come from cash contributions. And within a school, this could come from the students producing a program and putting ads in the program with support from community uh, businesses, or they could have popcorn for sale at their art gallery and things like that. So there is still the opportunity, or it could be simple as the PTA um, does a bake sale in support of it, things like that. So to be eligible for this, you have to be a teaching artist or a nonprofit organization. And again, over 18, not enrolled in a school program, the same sort of things as we said before. Things that we will not fund will be projects that take place out of Monroe or Livingston County, uh, groups with a parochial or homeschool environment. It has to be a public school setting. And standalone assemblies or field trips, uh, going to shows, seeing a single performance, it, the students have to produce something. So how do you apply for our grants? We have an online application, which is available at gvartscouncil.org, and I will show it to you in just a minute. We are using a different program than we had in the past. So this new program is called Submittable. I think it's a lot more simple than what was used in the past, but I will let you let, tell me if you think that is the case or not. The application deadline is for Livingston County. It is the third Thursday of September by 4 p.m., and that is September 17th. For Monroe, for Monroe County, it is the third Thursday of October, which is October 15th. This is the same as it's been in the past. It's always been the third Thursday of the month. This year is just the fact that the third Thursday falls fairly early in the month. There is a review period where if you submit an application, I will look it over and give you feedback on where you might need to grow and develop the project or where you might need to get some different materials. And I will review those applications up to three weeks before the deadline. So for Livingston County, that is August 27th, same thing, close of business at 4 p.m. And for Monroe County, that is September 24th. So we are going to go into the application now. Oh, my little thing is blocking it. Can I click it? There we go. So uh, I just used the Monroe County grant. As you can see, it has the date of when it's due right here at the top, as well as information on the eligibility and requirements. I do have more specific information linked here, which will take you to a Google Drive with all of the guidelines and supplemental materials that you might need to use. Uh, oh, I have to sign in. Hang on. Okay. Let's see if it'll let me in now. There. So this year, it's going to be all one application. Uh, I believe it was in the past there as well, but it is a separate application for Monroe and for Livingston County. Once that 4 p.m. deadline comes up, the application will be closed and you will not be able to access it anymore. Uh, it is a hard deadline and with this new program as well, if you submit your application early, you will be able to go back and edit it, uh, but you will need to request access from me, which I will send to you should the timeline work and it's not two minutes before the application is due. Um, as well as you are able to have other people work on the application with you and you are able to save it so you can work on later. I know there were issues with that last year with the program we used before. That should not happen this year, but if it does, please let me know as soon as it becomes an issue and I will reach out to the IT team working with this uh, program to make sure that that's not an issue. Again, this is the first year we're using this application. I'm hoping there won't be any issues, but just in case, let me know as soon as you can. When you first look at the application, it doesn't look as long as it has in the past, but that is because we have enabled branching within it. So if I click any one of the different grants, different questions will come up that are pertinent to each application. 
one other thing, or there's a couple other things, but one thing that's different this year is we are asking for demographic information. This is personal for me to make sure that I am reaching a diverse group of individuals in the application process and that every group and individual that wants to has the ability to apply because they have gathered the information. So this will just help me to track and make sure that I am reaching all aspects of people across the two counties and this information will not be shared with anyone else. So it'll be your age, what is your gender, your ethnicity, what's the highest schooling you have received, what is your employment status, marital status. And the other questions that are different this year are down here at the bottom, and this is related to COVID. So they are sort of vague, but I'm hoping that going through the narrative and assessing your project and figuring out how to work it, and in the future, we will have a better idea of how things will be going for next year. So the question of how will you approach the project differently than a pre COVID project? And how will you work around any and all COVID re related restrictions and issues that may be in effect? And I know it's going to be different for every single application, for every single program, but it's a way for us to gauge how much you are looking into the program and how you're looking into our current health epidemic. So going back to the seminar for the PowerPoint, the application is now open. It opened on July 20th, so you are able to access it. And at the end of this uh, seminar, I will be sending out a link to the applications as well as the Google file with all of the guidelines that I mentioned earlier, as well as a little exit ticket summary uh, survey to see if this was beneficial, any questions that you might have thought of that didn't come up or that you didn't get answered, and just to let me know how things are going if you think this was beneficial or not for your education. So our grant review process is fairly straightforward. We are going to look at the artistic merit of the project. Uh, what are the quality of the samples that you've submitted and the credentials of the artists involved? Have they done things before? Are you an artist that has never worked with kids, but now you want to work with kids, but you don't have a super strong lesson plan? Things like that are things that will be examined. The community benefit and how is it going to serve as a community? Is it going to or is it sort of vague and not super clear? And uh, the feasibility, do you clearly lay out point by point how you're going to do it, how you're going to ev evaluate it? Your budget is clear. You've given concise information about how you may have to deal with COVID in your program. Are you very clear with what you want to do? These are all things that the panel is going to be looking over. And after you have submitted the application, the I will review all of the applications. So it might take me a couple days, but I will get back to you if there's any issues. After that review process, your application will be sent to a panel of judges from the area. They might not necessarily be from the county that you were applying from, but they have to be involved in the arts in that community in some capacity. So it could be someone that lives in Wayne County but is directly involved in the uh, painting sphere and gallery sphere and is very involved in Monroe County or something to that regard. They will go through every single one of the applications for the county of application and we will meet together and go through all the applications and decide who deserves funding and who does not and go through any advice that they may want to give the panel or give the applicant. After that point, I will take the results of the panel to my board of directors and they will either approve or disapprove it. At that point, if everything has been approved, usually around early to mid-December before the holiday period, you will receive a notification of whether or not you receive funding along with the ability 
for a conversation where we discuss any panel feedback that came back. Well, if you are funded, you will be also sent a contract and that contract will need to be signed by January 31st at the latest. And after I receive that contract, you will receive your funding and award ceremony that is usually held in February. If you are not funded, you will have the opportunity to appeal the panel's decision. And at that point, a separate panel will be conducted to look over the appeal as well as the original panel decision to decide whether or not that individual should receive funding. If you are funded, you do have some uh, responsibilities. The project must take place between January 1st and December 31st of the application year. So that would be for next year, the year 2021. Any publicity and materials must be sent to me to be included in your file. And they also have to include a statement and credit that uh, you will be sent at a later point saying that you received the money from us through the decentralization program of New York State Council on the Arts, da, 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 da. And that information has to be included in every single piece of marketing material. If for whatever reason your budget changes and you don't use any, don't use a certain amount of funds, those funds have to be returned back to GVCA. And that's why we want a super detailed budget so that we fund you the correct amount of money. And 30 days after your project is complete and or January 31st of the following year, you must send a final report of how the project went. There is an asterisk on the first bullet point saying there is a possibility to extend to 2022 depending on COVID related restrictions. This is a caveat. You do have the ability to do it, but we do not want you to plan that into your application. This is a, just a little buffer to help programs so that we, we do still have art being produced, but we know that things are going to be changing. Things are changing on a daily basis and we want to still give you that support. So there is that caveat, you are still able to extend, but we would prefer you not to. So we really want you to build your program in a way that it can be done in 2021. So some of the revisions due to COVID, as I said earlier, virtual audiences can be included in audience tracking. And we've seen some really, really good success with that. Uh, we had one film, uh, film festival that went completely online and ended up having the largest festival they've had to date. They, uh, they had a survey that people had to fill out before they were able to access any of the films. And they had people from all over the state, all over the country. And I believe they actually had a few people from Belgium and Denmark that watched videos, which was kind of crazy and not something that they would have been able to have had it been solely in person. If you are an applicant for the year 2020 and you are applying for a project in 2021, anything that happened this year will not negatively affect your project for next year. This includes if you need to postpone your project to next year, which some of you I know have, the, you are still able to apply for a project in 2021, but they have to be completely separate. For example, if you normally would do a summer concert series in July this year, and you've pushed it to next June, you can still apply to do a summer program next July, but it needs to be a completely separate program, be that a different theme to the music or different composers or a different decade that you're highlighting. It needs to be something completely different so that there isn't an overlap of funds. Funds from this year cannot be carried over to a new project for next year. Oh. Sorry, I just moved a thing. I don't know if you can see that, but. Uh, and as I showed you before, applications will have a question regarding how you will fund the project with COVID in 2019, or 2019, COVID in 2021. So some of our grant writing tips. 
as I said before, make sure you are looking over the application guidelines. There's little things in there that can trip you up and be really easy to fix. Make sure you're looking over all of the award criteria and that it's something that will work for you. If uh, I go into that in a minute, um, make sure you have as complete and as rounded out as an application as you can. Use you have, I believe, for most of the questions, you up to two. You have up to two thousand characters. Use all of the characters if you need to, but also make sure that you're using concise language and that even though you're using all of that space, it's not super vague and leaving things out. You want to have a as detailed an application as you can with the materials and the narrative and support from the community. If you are able to complete a rough draft before the deadline, definitely take advantage of that. I will look over it, read it, give you any notes, any feedback, let you know, hey, this resume doesn't seem like it fits. Is this artist going to be working with you? I don't see where they are in the narrative section, things like that. Make sure your presentation is consistent and the information makes sense. I would highly suggest giving a copy of your application to someone that is not involved in the project whatsoever, because sometimes when we're working on things, we can get so close to it that we don't see those errors and those holes. But someone that's not involved in it whatsoever could read it over and go, but what about this part? You said that there was going to be this many people, but then you say here that only this many people can be allowed in the space and da 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 da. Things like that can be really helpful to have someone else look over your application. As far as your supporting materials, make sure they are professional. If you can get them on a business letterhead, do that. If you can uh, get the resume in a different format, I would highly suggest having everything be typed rather than handwritten. Um, and make sure that it, like for your, for example, your letters of support, make sure that it is a clear letter of support and not just like, yeah, I talked to this person on Tuesday, Sally said that we can do this. That's not quite a letter of support that's saying, yes, we will support you, but it's not something from the school saying, yes, we will work with you. And as far as your budget, make sure, as I've said multiple times, it is as clear as you can make it. If, and to the market level, if you need to hire a lighting designer and the lighting designer's going rate is $200 a day, you're paying that artist $200 a day. If you are applying for other grants, make sure that that is also in the application and that you are planning or hoping to get money from that grant. If there is a $10,000 shortfall in your application and you don't say like, hey, we're also applying for this grant or this money is coming from X, the panel might look at that and go, okay, you're asking for $5,000 from us, but then there's still another $5,000 that you're not saying where it's going to come from. Why would we fund that when it's going to be $5,000 in the hole before it even gets started? Things like that will make your application stronger. If you can, stay local. If you know that you have support in the town you grew up or that you have support from XYZ, work with those people if you can, because then you know that you have a backbone to your project and you will have people that will come to it and things like that. Projects that stay local tend to do better. Look at who has gotten funding before. If you want to produce a dance program with a local symphony orchestra, has someone else done that in the past and did they receive funding? How did they do it? Maybe reach out to them and ask them for advice for the application. This is all little things, but it could be really helpful and make sure that you get your project. If you have applied in the past, go back through and review that panel feedback that you received. How can you improve on what you did before? Or if you did get uh, approved, how are you building your program and over the years changing it and adapting to the different times and the different programs? The application changes every year, little things change. 
the atmosphere of the communities where you're applying in changes? How are you growing with the times? And as always, I'm here for help. I currently am not in the office, um, but I am always available by email. And if you call our office, I will get the phone call within a few days and be able to answer you. So if you have any other questions or things like that, you are able to reach out to me. My email is grants at gvartscouncil.org. And that is the office phone number. Again, my name is Caitlin. If you want to have a draft review, just let me know in advance, uh, but I will get the notification when it comes through. So now we are going to switch things over to our, oh, where, where is my, oh, I've got to stop sharing the screen. We're gonna switch things over to Evelyn and Missy, I'm not sure which one of you would like to go first. I'm happy to go first. I, I, Caitlin, you were very thorough. <laughs> I'm not sure really exactly what to add except to say, um, so I, I run a company called Biodance. It's a, it's a dance company, but it's very collaborative. And um, we've been funded for a number of years. And um, the biggest advice I can give you is to really follow those directions, like look at the criteria and address each criteria. Um, and, and generally, like, there's categories or questions that they ask, and I, in my grant, just title a section up with that title, and then I answer the question. I title the next section, I answer the question, so that I'm making sure that I hit all of those points. Um, the, for, for me, it's been the community arts grant that I have received, and so, you know, paying attention to how I'm engaging the community in the process, not just giving a performance to the community, but like how, how they can be part of the, the journey along the way has been important. Um, and just not waiting till the end, because you realize as you go, um, oh, I didn't figure that out, or I need to figure out this number. I mean, so just, just start early <laughs> because it takes, I mean, it generally takes me about 10 hours to do this, but not 10 consecutive hours because in between I have to wait for so-and-so to respond or I have to, you know. So um, just, you know, starting when you can and then filling in later. Um, I don't know. I mean, if there are specific questions, I'm happy to respond to those, but I... I feel like you know, really paying attention to what the what the guidelines are asking, and 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 like Caitlin said, making sure that it that you're not just talking about the project, but you're actually stating all of the the facts, like when and where and who and and why even you know, <laughs> all of those questions. Hi, Caitlin. <laughs> Thank you for um, having me here and yeah. everybody. Um, last year was actually the first time uh, my organization applied for a grant. Um, we are a small um, our organization that concentrates in Latin America folkloric dances. And normally we get the funds by the boards and we do a lot of 80% um, of my board work in Xerox. So we get corporate matching for every dollars that we donated. So that was plenty for us to support the programs. Um, this last year, we decided to expand and now have more community engagement. So we went to the community arts uh, grant. Now we are 100% volunteer based. So that being said, we work around the time that we have left. So there are three things that are really important before you apply to the grant. Number one is the draft. Make sure you put in a piece of paper, a clear draft, think in bullets. Okay, what are we going to, what is the project? So what is the project name? What are we doing? Very simple, high level, um, because the time and the space is very limited. You have like 300 characters, 500 characters, so think in bullets, very high level, everything that you put on that. Also, when you're pu putting together a sample of the arts, what we deliver is mostly dances. So keep it in less than three minutes. 
or the files get very heavy and you won't be able to upload. So if instead of putting the entire shows, if you can take clips of the art or if you're putting together where PowerPoint will work. So use Canva is a really easy tool that you can put presentation and where you download it, it's in a small files that is gonna make your life so much simple. And you can, and it will look very professional. Like we don't have staff to create fancy videos. We go to Canva and it's really, really well done and high quality. So I do recommend that program is free um, in case that you don't have a graphic designers that can make something fancy or came out really good. Um, Something else that I also recommend is the budget. Before the deadline, so I'm already start working on my budget just because um, everything is delayed. We need to get quote from uh, the auditoriums and that is being delayed. So you wanna start that now. So that way when August, you have your draft, you have an anticipated cost way ahead so don't wait until next month oh we have until november get it done now because things can change um something else that i do want to bring that up um thinking your virtual audience we don't know what's going to happen on 21 so you will have your live audience but also think in your virtual have those married together like we were looking to deliver um a dance show um instead of looking for a small auditorium, now we have to quote one that have at least 1000 capacity because we might have to have one row in between the audience. So yes, Nivia. So yes, think in a bigger audience. It got, it's going to cost you more, but it's worth it because then you can actually have your show live. We don't know what's going to be the restriction next year. We're anticipating that we're going to be live streaming at the same time that we're gonna have sales mm -hmm. tickets. So that way we can deliver with the funders and we can also have the opportunity. Um, very important that you also have, and I put some notes here, is the, um, who is going to, how many um, artists are you working with? For example, we work with different artists. We hire, uh, we have a um, percussionist that is teaching Brazilian, Batucada, we have a visual artist and we have two dance instructors. They do need to give you a signed letter of commitment. You will need that with the resume. That will take them time. Um, if they are, even if they're thin, if they're young, make sure that you put together a plain contract that you can add with their bios. You will need that when they're asking you for their information. So that's something that before you apply, you do need to get that done. Uh, for me, it wasn't even the budget, what was more difficult, it was the timeline. So when you are drafting, you have your goal, you know what your project name is, you know what is the programs, we're doing dance, we're doing um, educational lectures, we're doing the visual components. Then, very important, why are we doing this? Because there is no, there is a lot of folkloric tradition teaching in our community. So you have the, the four whys, right? What are you doing? When are you doing? Why are you doing that? Um, oh, obviously the cost that I will get there in a little bit, but um, the timeline is gonna be so useful because it's gonna make you think, okay, in August I need to do marketing. Now you put another bullet, okay, marketing, how much is gonna cost? I don't have a big budget. We are volunteer based and most of us donated, but marketing is powerful. And then you start researching, okay, there are newspapers that we can add our information for free into the calendar. So we put that into the marketing, right? We have social media. We need to increase the followers, at least 10 new followers every week. So we do need to create content to entertain people. So you put that in your, in your marketing pile. Um, Obviously, how can we elevate the voice of our artists? So we're gonna start creating now podcasts so they can start, or little stories, right? It can be no more than a minute because now social media gets bored easily and they wanna just scroll. Okay, so no more than one minute, keep it very high level. This is my artist. I'm gonna collaborate with Mitzi. We're gonna make something amazing. I have them. That can be part of your marketing. It doesn't cost too much. 
but it's powerful. So you can add that into your marketing. And then you also want to have in your timelines when you're doing. So in July, we're working in the marketing. In June, we're gonna go with our press release. You want to have a press release out. So in order to have a press release, you need a list or where you're gonna send the press release. So you need to start getting, gathering the local newspaper, the local TV channels, the local magazine, the influencers, because now social media is so powerful that you wanna start connecting with the students that are doing something similar so they can also share your story. And that's part of the collaboration, right? It's, it's good to have that. So you put all those in your timeline and that will make you also think, okay, I know by November, by October, I need to have this done. And it makes it so much simple. Like for me, I don't have time. I have a full-time job, two kids, a husband, I mean, uh, and now I'm gonna be a home teacher. So you do wanna have a timeline. It makes you keep stay in track and get things done because it's very easily that we get distracted. So that's gonna be super, super important. Then who is your partner? Who is gonna be helping you to make this possible? Um, if you don't have a partner on this, it, it will be challenging. Um, so a partner can be your local artists that are teaching, but it's also the community, right? My, one of my partners is Nazareth College de Casa Hispana. They're gonna host a couple of the lectures, they're hosting some of the workshops. So those are considered in-kind donations. Think about in your community, in your network, who can partner with you? So you are not alone in this. Who can be, who is doing something similar that can help, help you elevate in your voice? Can be a radio, a radio DJ that they can help you amplify your voice. So thinking your partners are all the people that like what you're doing and they can also be part of the success of the project. That's a, that is powerful. So I have at least 10 partners. Um, didn't happen overnight, but it, it was so important that when I mentioned that, I realized that, wow, I, I have something strong that make me in a better position than other candidates. And that's, I mean, and sometimes we don't even notice how many people we are that are aligned with us and we forget to mention, but that makes your application strong and powerful. And of course, your contents, what are you delivering? Is, are you doing uh, visual arts or you're doing a sculpture? Um, you have a bigger audience, so it will be more difficult to navigate into the social, but you can tell the story behind each piece have that ready because it's also important that you connect to the people um who are your participants so once you have your partners who are the participants who are the ones that are going to benefit of this community engagement have that ready thinking those for me for example i have my younger student that is three year old my oldest is 65 so I cover a multi-generation, but what are you covering? Thinking those things, okay, and I'm only to school students. What's gonna happen next year if these students are homeschooled? So how, thinking all those possible scenarios, who are gonna be your participants? Because that's an important component of your grant. Um, obviously the demographic, right? That's part of that question. And I'm in trouble with the time, Kathleen, because I can talk forever. <laughs> <laughs> no, I think you're, it's great. You're being very thorough and you're also reiterating a lot of the points that I had in, in a sort of different way. And it's really cool. Uh, <laughs> so I, I will mention a little bit of the budget, right? For me, it was the very first time that I applied last year. Yeah, which and I'm going to bring up the gonna, budget as you're talking. So we can yeah, so that. for me, the budget was a little more different because I'm not a hundred thousand organization. We basically just pay as we get. We do career sell for fundraising. But for this particular project that I apply, I have uh, anticipated revenue, right? That I did mention that. I mentioned into my income. I think she have it under the income. I did put a parenthesis and I put anticipated because I'm gonna have tickets that I'm gonna be selling. So I did mention that into my budget. Although I don't know how much money I'm going to be selling because we don't know what's going to happen. I have an anticipated idea. Normally we sell $20 per ticket and a minimum of 300 uh, capacity. Um, let's say that that's 
that's kind of like and and you kind of put that into your income then you also put uh, miscellaneous contributions which can be i'm going to have a program and i'm going to be selling advertising at this cost so that can be anticipated right for example media have a bunch of com companies that always um promoting to her program so those are anticipated she's going to mention that even though she doesn't have the cash now she can anticipate how much is she will be expecting then we also have um some fees so some of the students some of the classes the student pays to be able to attend um, this year was challenging because we did zoom and most of the class went for free instead of the pay um and then we use the grant to pay the artists and call the day so we can move on with the show the show must go on <laughs> but you also put that into your budget if their students are paying for this um you put it over there and then you put another grant that you are possibly going to apply so in, on top of this grant you're applying for community foundation you can also put that into your anticipated budget so that way you don't feel discouraged that the, the entire project costs $20,000. You have other anticipation. And I think that's also powerful and it's important. And then in the expenses, uh, obviously your marketing costs, you have to think in how you're going to promote the event. If you're going to buy an ad in the newspaper, those are costs that you need to start piling into your marketing. Um, for us, we are going to do live stream parallel to our show. Uh, and we are not hiring a company to do the live stream. We are actually purchasing the cameras and the additional network. And we are hiring a consultant to do the training to the team because this is something we might have to do through the year. We don't know how often and we don't have that kind of budget. So you will add, you want to have into your equipment purchase uh in, or into your budget how would you become now a virtual and you need to have okay i don't know anything about zoom and class and and converting virtual material that's crazy and that's a lot of work but you can hire somebody to train you or you can get a student to train you and you add those costs um if you work with multiple teachers like i do i have to have equipment for them in their home so they can teach virtually so we have to add those calls for the cameras for the special uh, lights that they need to be able to deliver the experience or if you're going to do the workshop online add those into your cost um evaluation we normally use survey monkey so i don't have a lot of cost for evaluation but i do have professional fees add those into the cost and you will have to also identify how much you're going to be covered to the grant uh, to those costs so if i'm using 400 in costumes and i don't know 1000 in an art teaching artist you will have to identify that from the five thousand dollars you're using this to cover the teaching these to pay for the supplies and these for the equipment that I need to make it possible. So that's very important that before you apply to the grant, you know where you're going to be using that money. Okay. Uh, any questions? Stop, you're say, I'm going to stop you there, Evelyn, and we'll open it up to see if we have any questions because yes. we've covered a lot and I want to make sure I'm that sorry. any, no, you're totally fine. It's very thorough and I appreciate that. <laughs> Missy, you were putting your hand up. For Evelyn, and that is um, you. You mentioned Canva. I wondered if you could spell that or put it's it in oh. Canva. C A Canva. Uh, C A N B A. Yeah, and yeah. I put it in the chat. I love that program. I use it for everything. I use it all the it's time for my so personal easy. business stuff as well. Yeah. So we create um, like the values for the artists. You just type like resume and all you have to do is like copy and paste. It's like a designer for dummies. I love it. It's so easy because I don't have time, mm -hmm. but you yeah. want to create very professional videos. You want to create very professional resumes for your artists. And that program is free and they have it. I mean, you sometimes, if you're using photos from their um, drop down, they have to cost like a dollar if you want something specific, but if not, everything is there and they make really you can even make small clips of videos in, and 
change that in MP4 in no time. Like, I don't know how to convert something from MP3 to MP4. They can do that over there in one click. So yeah. it's a really cool program. I do recommend that a lot. And you said earlier um, about the file sizes. We definitely would prefer the files to say, stay smaller, but with the new program, we will be able to take larger files if it is required. Mm -hmm. um, but if it is a series of videos, we would suggest, uh, I believe in the past, it was a PDF with a series of links that the panel could click through. That's also really beneficial. Uh, Canva can also be made to create anything for social media, be it Instagram posts, uh, banner pages. Um, I use it a lot for my personal author business with most of my posts. And once you start using it, you will start to see other organizations that are using it because you'll see different elements of it. And it's actually quite funny. You're like, huh, I know where you made that. Um, <laughs> it is, it is easy. If you have a not for profit, you can also apply for the uh, free account. Mm -hmm. the free, I mean, it's already free, but you have uh, access to content, like for photos. Um, I don't need that because I use my own photos from mm -hmm. the stuff we make. But if you want to make something, I don't know what your needs are, but uh, you can, you will get those for free. So okay. that's um, a good thing. As far as like partner resources, some of the other, uh, in one of our other applications, or seminars, what is this called? Uh, one of our other seminars uh, pointed out that for a lot of people, the thing that is holding them back is getting those resources from other individuals. I like what you said, Evelyn, about like pretty much making it for them just to send it to them to sign. Um, but that can be a main thing that people are waiting on. And I believe there was two or three applicants last year that had their application pending and ready to go, oh, but no. because they didn't get certain materials of support from people, they weren't able to apply. So if there is people that you want to partner with, I would start contacting them today now. to get that material <laughs> yeah. because they'll be like, oh, it's not needed till September or October. I'll get it yes. to you. And then you're going, hey, it's two days before. Come on, let's go. And as also with the deadline, uh, if the review period is needed or, um, Obviously you have up until that four o'clock on Thursday where I will do a sort of a, not as detailed review, but I will make sure all the materials are there and you will have a, about a 24 hour grace period. But it's kind of like if you're submitting a paper to a professor, the earlier you do it, the better, because if it's, you're submitting it at 2.30 and the application is due at four, I'm not going to be able to give you as much time to do that process. So. Definitely submit it earlier rather than later, um, and especially for that review deadline as well. The closer we are to the deadline, the more my brain is mush. I can't give as good feedback when I'm reading so many applications. Um, so that would be one thing. And with the fiscal partnership, I'm just reviewing my notes at the end that came up in the past. Sorry, it's noon. Um, the fiscal partnership can also be sort of a mentorship and can be an opportunity for an artist to learn more things that you might not have been able to learn on your own and to help give you the skills. You might be a nonprofit, but want to do a fiscal partnership with a larger organization who will have more connections that you have. And that is totally okay as well. So now I'm gonna open it up to questions. <laughs> so if you have any um, questions, Nadia. Nadia. Nidia, uh, Evelyn, sorry. are you, Evelyn, this is Nidia. Are you with um, the Panamanian group or the, which group are you with? It's called Grupo Cultural Latinos in Rochester. Ah, okay. It's a long name. And trust me, I didn't want the long name, but they're like, oh, well, you know, we use long last name, so. We yes. A lot of the times when I reference you, I say Grupo Cultural, and yeah. then it continues on. <laughs> no, we call it Gicler. Okay. Grupo Cultural, Grupo Cultural, explique yeah. eso otra vez, por favor. Grupo Cultural Latinos en Rochester. <laughs> so we say Gicler. And I just post the website for everybody mm -hmm. um, to so, have an idea okay. of. So any of our other individuals have any questions, feel free to unmute yourself at this time and just pop in. 
Yeah. The other question I want to know is, are you going to be able to access everything that you just shared? Um, your your power presentation, PowerPoint I can send out the PowerPoint if you would like that, um, but I will be sending out the, I don't know if you can hear that, the fire alarm is going off in the town. Maybe it'll stop. Okay, okay. Um, I'm sorry if that's echoing. Yeah, I, I sorry, my mom's in the background. Um, I will be sharing that guideline in a little bit um, along with the survey and things like that. So you will have that information to access after. Um, yes, I will be sending that out to you. Raymond, you had a question. I saw you try yes, to pop in a little I, bit. I don't know if I'm in the right uh, ballpark uh, or not. I'm 85 years old. I've just completed writing a memoir. Okay. And the editors and proofreaders that I have lined up to do this for me at mm -hmm. much reduced price, unfortunately, um, disappeared. Oh. Uh, two of them passed away, and one oh. moved to Florida, and I, I've lost contact. Okay. So, to get this done, I, I'm a retired printer, and typographer and I know enough about writing that you never want to proofread anything of your own <laughs> and uh, there are people that call themselves proofreaders much like there are people that own a camera and call themselves a photographer it's not mm -hmm. the same yep uh, so I I know now I will have to hire, find and hire a local editor, a local proofreader, a local uh, printer, and a local bookbinder to complete my project. Is this, is this something that would be considered in giving a grant or am I just uh, I, I would have to look into it. I don't know as far as the printing and things. Um, I personally have my own author business, so I do know and understand the costs and things that come with it. So I, I fully sympathize with you in that regards. Um, I'm not sure if we, where we'd fall. I know we have had literary applications in the past. It is written into our information. Um, but I'm not quite sure how people have done it. Um, I personally just started this position last year, and up until this point, we have not had any literary applications. I do know two years ago, we did fund a individual artist to write and stage a play. So there is funding that is available, but his play was also based on a historical landmark within the county. So, we might need to talk on a separate thing to really look into like what your memoir is about and how it can be related to the community and how we could twist it to make it be a thing. So I would suggest, um, let me do some research and some digging. I'll contact some of the other grant coordinators across the state and see how people have done it in the past. Um, if you wanna email me, I know we were corresponding shortly, um, a little bit about your memoir and it would help me to get some more information to see if it would be possible. Okay, I have your email address so mm -hmm. I can contact you in that respect and we can take it from there. Thank you yeah. very much. And of course. Incidentally, uh, I really commend you on your presentation skills. Thank uh, you. That, that was a long way to go before you took a sip of water. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, well done. Thank, Thank you. you. You have any other questions? No, we've got a big group today. It's my biggest group, so I'm, I'm glad so many people are getting the information. If you don't, um, just also one of the questions in the grant is going to be if you are not getting the hundred percent of the funds, how are you going to fund the the uh, imbalance? I have a plan for that also ahead. Uh, if how if, if you don't get if your project costs five thousand and you only get two thousand five hundred um how are you going to plan to 
fund the difference. Mm -hmm. um, I know it's different this year because it's only, you're doing 80%, which is amazing. Uh, but also taking those, um, mm -hmm. have those in, in the top of your draft, how would you um, supply the imbalance? Yes. Um, so going off of that, not all of the grants will receive full funding. So for example, if you apply for a grant and you ask 2,500, the panel might decide to only give you 1,800. So what Evelyn is referencing is how would you, if the project does require, or the panel does decide to fund you that lesser amount, how would you make up that shortfall based on what information you've given us in the budget? Would you increase your fundraising? Uh, what, how would you, make up that shortfall. Um, for some yeah. people, it is a make or break question. And if you do not receive fiscal funding, you would not be able to do the project. And that is okay to say, but know that that could be a strike against you, but it could also be a benefit to show like, hey, we're a new community organization. We're, mm -hmm. This is gonna be our first big project. We don't have the funds to get started, but this is something that we really want to be a thing. But if we don't get that funding, it won't go through or if you're a past organization and for example this year hit you really really hard and if this money doesn't come through you won't be able to make up the shortfall based on how 2020 went that's okay to say as well so going that's a very important question that um yeah, that, can can be a sticking point for people yeah i know it took me a couple of cells of my brain to think okay <laughs> i need to be creative uh, how I'm going to stand out when that's a lot of people apply for this and this year is going to be even more because now we are all struggling like before it wasn't that bad because we always get some income through the school from uh, shows but this year is non-income for anybody so I'm pretty sure it's going to anticipate more people applying than before mm -hmm. so you want to have that over there that you have a plan b and then c and a D if it's necessary so your applications stand out uh, from the big pile um, that we're anticipating. And um, this is important uh, for me, how we recognize the success. Um, SurveyMonkey is free tool. You don't need to hire somebody to do that, but Survey, I think it's called SurveyMonkey. That could be a great tool uh, to pass in your social media, or I use email, I'm old school that way, so I use a lot of emails, um, that you can also collect feedback and get an idea, uh, how did we do, how was our show, did you like it, not like it. Um, success sometimes is not just a big show, but it's also getting the feedback of the people, how can you do better? and have that also in your in your plan um and then again among your participants your students you want to collect their voice you want to collect the dancers opinion did you like participating with me um, and you can be creative on that one i mean i work with toddlers so it's i'm not expecting them to sit down in a computer and fill out a form but use your creativity on how you're going to engage to collect also their their opinion um and I think, I think that's it from my side. <laughs> For anybody else that has questions, comments? Great job. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Well, oh, you're welcome. If there's no other questions at this point, I think we will call it for the day. As I said, I will be sending you an email shortly with the survey to review this process, the guidelines and all of the information, as well as the links to the application for you to apply to. So thank, thank you for stopping by. Oh. Thank you, have a great day. Thank you, have a great good luck day. everybody. Evelyn, Bye -bye. good seeing you. Good to see you, Nidia, take care.